so I'd like to thank the organizers, first of all, for giving me an opportunity to speak. Um, I've been really enjoying these number three web seminars and certainly I personally would hope that they maybe could continue even after coronavirus because I think they've been a really, really good thing and I've really enjoyed lots of the talks. Um, so today I'd like to talk about primes in arithmetic regressions to large moduli. And so the basic question that I want to think about is uh, just one of the most important questions in prime number theory. How many primes are there which are less than some number x and in some residue class a modulo q? So you give me maybe your three favorite positive integers, x, a, and q, and I have to tell you how many primes there are which are less than x and congruent to a modulo q. And I'm going to write pi of x q a for this number of primes. And as I'm sure everyone here is very familiar with, um, provided A and Q are co-prime, we know that there's infinitely many primes in any given reduced Trinity class A mod Q. And so as X becomes larger and larger and larger, the number of primes in any of these residue classes gradually tends to infinity. And this is Dirichlet's famous theorem. Of course, if A and Q aren't co-prime, then there must be some common factor, and so there can be at most one prime in that residue class. Um, so given Dirichlet's theorem, the focus of my talk is really on the how many bit and quantitative questions about how large X needs to be before I start getting um, good estimates for the number of primes in these different arithmetic regressions. And in particular, a very natural guess would be that the only important constraint is the one that Dirichlet noticed that A and Q have to be co-prime. And after a certain point, it shouldn't just be that we have several primes in each of these different residue classes like Q. It should be that actually we have roughly the same number. So maybe a refined question after Dirichlet's theorem is how big does X need to be for there to be about the same number of primes in each of the different reduced residue classes modulo Q. So just to make sure we're all on the same page, here's a numerical example which sort of typifies the sorts of cases that I'm interested in. So you could have decided that your favorite three numbers in the world are 1,000, 1 million, and 33. And so then the challenge for me would be to ask how many primes are there which are less than a million and they have their final two digits, uh, final three digits as being 0, 3, 3. So then the residue class uh, 33 mod 1,000. And you can check this on a computer and you find that there's 172 different primes which are less than a million and they're in the residue class 33 mod 1000. And in fact, you can check this for lots of choices of A and you find that the number of primes which are less than a million in whatever residue class is always some number between 172 and 218. So, in this case, we're looking at um, a modulus Q, which is about the square root of X. And we're seeing uh, not necessarily perfect equidistribution, but a pretty similar number of primes in each of the different residue classes, modulo Q. And it's particularly when Q is around the square root of X, which is going to be the case that I'm particularly interested in here. And in this case, we're not getting perfect equidistribution, but the primes are almost equidistributed in the different residue classes, and you're certainly getting a decent number of primes in each of these possible residue classes. So what can we actually prove theoretically on this question? Well, unfortunately, very little. So the only unconditional result we really know in this setting is the Ziegel-Valfitz theorem which says that 
if Q is quite a lot smaller than X, then you do indeed get equidistribution. Um, but for the ziegel valfitz theorem, the threshold for when you get equidistribution is when Q is at most some fixed power of a logarithm. So you can have an arbitrary large fixed power of a logarithm, provided you're looking at big enough numbers. So you could think of this as being, provided Q is less than log X to the power 100, and X is large enough, then you get an equidistribution in different relationship classes modulo Q. But unfortunately, for lots of applications in number theory and elsewhere, we would really like Q to be able to be taken to be quite a lot larger than this arbitrary power of a logarithm. Um, but this has been an open problem, and we've been completely stuck on this for a very long period of time to make any possible progress to allow Q to be even just a little bit larger than a power of a logarithm of X would require to get some uh, new results on so-called Ziegel-Landau exceptional zeros. And this would have all kinds of other amazing consequences um, for bounds on class numbers and many problems in analytic number theory. And we really don't know how to disprove this potential existence of a few bad zeros, which can really mess up this count. But without understanding more about zero and our zeros, we don't have any hope of doing better than what's implied by the zero valfitz theorem. So this is maybe a bit disappointing. We quite quickly get one nice quantitative result, but to make any progress on this nice quantitative result, we need to overcome some famous huge obstacle that we really have no ideas of how to even approach. But we believe that the, there shouldn't be any of these bad exceptional zeros. And in particular, we believe that the generalized dream hypothesis should be true. And if you assume the generalized dream hypothesis, since that excludes these bad zeros, it does enable you to get make progress. And in fact, it enables you to prove a pretty strong result. So if you assume the generalized dream hypothesis, then you get this same equidistribution that there's roughly the same number of primes in each res residue class, modulo Q, and this works provided Q is smaller than the square root of X. So when X is large, the square root of X is much, much larger than just the fixed power, power of the logarithm of X. And the fact that Q can be as large as a power of X is really useful for various applications. So, if we take this big assumption on zeros of the Riemann zeta function and Dirichlet L functions, then we get a much more powerful and much stronger equidistribution statement. But even this GOH bound, we think is way short of what should really be the truth. And so Montgomery conjectured that you don't need to have anything like a strong restriction as making Q of size smaller than the square root of X. In fact, provided Q is just a little bit smaller than X, so maybe X to the power 0.99, he conjectured that you should still have this equidistribution of primes in any given arithmetic progression modulo Q. So even the GRH here is really not giving us anything quantitatively like the truth, although it's a really noticeable improvement on the original ziegel valfitz experiment. So maybe this is a bit depressing that we can only prove this in comparison, very, very weak result, the ziegel valfitz theorem. And for lots of applications, we would like to have results that are much closer to the GOH bound or indeed potentially beyond the GOH bound and closer to Montgomery's conjecture. And for an individual Q, we are completely stuck and we don't know how to do this. But for many of these applications, we don't actually need to show that you have perfect equidistribution for every individual choice of Q. It's OK to just show it's true for most values of Q. And so the famous theorem in this direction is the bombier vinogradov theorem, which roughly says that the generalized dreaming hypothesis bound is true on average. 
So this is often written as the way I put it as a theorem here, that when you sum over all moduli Q a little bit smaller than the square root of X, and you look at the worst residue class, then the difference between uh, the actual number you get and what you'd expect if you had perfect equi equidistribution, this quantity is small. But if you're not very familiar with these things, that might look like an awful mess, but the key consequence of it is it's shown for um, a growing proportion, so for the vast majority of Qs in this GRH range going up to the square root of X, we do have this perfect equidistribution. And so it's only a small number of potential bad moduli that could possibly cause any problems. And they're suitably rare that for lots of applications, this is actually good enough. So there's a huge number of results where maybe people originally proved it assuming the generalized dream hypothesis, and then the bombier vinogradov theorem came along and it enabled them to get an unconditional proof of the same result because it works for cues in the same range and it doesn't matter that there's only, um, there could be a few bad exceptions. The fact that it's true for most of the cues is the important thing here. So in, particularly, in particular, for sieve methods, this is an absolutely vital result and it's exactly as good as the Riemann hypothesis. So for lots of results in sieve methods, you gain absolutely nothing over the bombier vinogradov theorem if you assume the generalized dreaming hypothesis, because you only ever care about these average results, the typical values of the modulus Q. So just to summarize, for an individual value of Q, we're really struck, stuck to the ziegel valfitz theorem, and we have no idea of how to make progress. If you assume a big conjecture like the generalized dreaming hypothesis, then you can get up to this threshold of around the square root of X, but for many applications, an adequate substitute is the bombier vinogradov theorem that says the generalized dream hypothesis is true on average over Q in the same sorts of range. And so the key thing I want to highlight here is that this is exactly the same range as the generalized dream hypothesis for Qs going up to about the square root of X. Um, and this square root of X really seems to be a fairly fundamental barrier. So we believe that one should be able to go beyond the square root of X. Indeed, I mentioned Montgomery's conjecture that says even just point wise for an individual Q, you should be able to go up to X to the power 0 0.99. But we don't have any terribly plausible way of proving such a result, even assuming big fancy conjectures like the Riemann hypothesis or the pair correlation conjecture. Um, when you're talking about Qs beyond this square root of X. So the square root of X um, has become a big barrier and maybe one challenge that's existed for a while in analytic number theory is just to get any improvement on this square root of X to um, go from the general, from the bombier vinogradov range where you can handle most moduli which are a little bit smaller than the square root of X to be able to get, just get some tiny improvement to try and handle most moduli that are a little bit bigger than the square root of X. So this is something that we don't know how to do, uh, but it would be really nice if we could do this. And this square root of X barrier um, is not just a artificial limitation of our techniques. For lots of applications as well, um, there's something special that happens around the square root of X. Um, so kind of, there's a few different ways in which you can think of this as an important barrier. So one reason it's very difficult to um, show anything going beyond the square root of X is that morally, uh, the generalized dream hypothesis says that all the zeros are on the one half line. The bombier vinogradov theorem is saying that most of the zeros are on the half line and there's suitably few exceptions that there's only a few bad moduli Q that could cause any problems. But to go beyond Q in the range, the square root of X, you need to show interactions between different L functions rather than just one L function itself. And we have no even plausible way of thinking of any technique that would show um, cancellation between the ordinates of different zeros, um, even if you assume 
uh, questions about the pair correlation conjecture and their distribution along the half line. So it really seems a very difficult question that we have no idea of how to tackle. And the other point is that there's several problems where it's the behavior about primes in arithmetic regressions right around this quote of X barrier that's a critical threshold for whether you can understand it or not. So um, with the work of Goldson, Pintz, and Yodium on banner gaps between primes, uh, they could show banner gaps between primes if you could get a um, suitable version of the bombier fillet and Grada theorem that went just a little bit beyond this one half barrier, just an epsilon beyond it. Similarly, there's other problems such as the Titchmarsh divisor problem or Artin's conjecture on primitive roots or the number of representations of primes as which can be represented as the sum of two squares plus one, where um, all the proofs of these results um, naturally run into problems when you're talk to do with primes in arithmetic progressions, which are very close to the square root of x. And for some of these problems, you can get around this by other slightly ad hoc methods, but it's a fundamental threshold that comes up in lots of different problems the behavior around the square root of x being a critical point where you either need another argument or you need a result which is in the direction of the challenge that I put up here. So this challenge has been around for quite some time. Uh, we believe it's hard and this is still very much open and I would love it if someone could prove this even for some like pathetically small constant delta. So in the direction of this challenge, there was some really pioneering work um, over several different papers of Bombieri, Fouvry, Freelander, and Ivaniec, which did successfully go beyond this square root of x barrier, at least in special cases. So they couldn't quite prove my challenge, but they could prove various weakened forms of the challenge for different notions of weakened. So I just want to highlight two different results here. Um, and so uh, this is a result of Bombay, Friedlander, Ivaniec. And if you just fix the residue class A as some constant, so maybe we're thinking of A as being one or two, and we're looking at um, the number of primes which are congruent to say one mod Q on average over Q, then they were able to show a very weak form of uh, equidistribution in the sense that for most Qs, you have roughly the expected count. So um, in the bombier vinogradov theorem, the right-hand side was, the, a trivial bound to the right-hand side would be pi of x. And in the bombier vinogradov theorem, you could make the right-hand side smaller by an arbitrary power of a logarithm. Here, they're only beating the trivial bounds by a factor delta squared, where delta is the constant um, of how far beyond one half you're going. But one consequence of this is for, say, 99% of moduli Q of size x to the half plus one over a million, you have almost the expected number. So you have, you're often the expected number by at most a factor of 1% um, from what you guess for the number of primes, which are less than X and congruent to one modulo Q. So this just is non-trivial when you're looking at moduli very close to X to the one half, but it is able to say something non-trivial beyond this Riemann hypothesis range. And this is completely unconditional. It doesn't, require the generalized stream hypothesis and there's no clear way of how the generalized stream hypothesis would help you in these sorts of questions at all. Um, a second result is you could weaken the question by not looking at this um, difference between the number of primes in the residue class and the expectation um, with absolute values but instead some with certain weights that are nice um, and the, often, the way that their result is stated is for certain well-factual weights. 
which means that they can, whenever you have Q, which can be written as Q1 times Q2, um, this weight lambda Q factorizes very nicely. And moreover, it's only supported on uh, integers Q, which factorize very well. And the key point of these well factorable weights is that this is precisely the sort of problem that comes up uh, in sieve methods. So again, this only works if you're fixing the residue class A. So you're thinking of A as being one or two. But from the point of view of sieve methods, this second theorem, BFI2, is often a completely adequate unconditional substitute for the bombier vinograda theorem that allows you to move from uh, moduli q going up to x to one half to moduli q going up to x to four sevenths. Um, and so correspondingly, this gives various improvements to lots of different sieve quantities. And using this, for example, you can get a um, fairly simple proof of Chen's theorem that there are infinitely many primes such that p plus two has at most two prime factors. So, um, so this is a weakening with these well factorable weights, but under this weakening, you can go concretely beyond one half and in fact as large to four sevenths. And from the point of view of sieve methods, in lots of setups, this is just as good as if you had the Bombier Vinogradov theorem statement itself with four sevenths in place of one half. So these are two explicit, explicit examples going beyond x to one half. The final example going beyond this generalized dream hypothesis range that I'd like to talk about is um, the work of Zhang and then its refinements by the Polymath 8A project. Um, so Zhang was able to look at this difference with absolute values. Um, but one key restriction was that he could only look at moduli Q, which are bigger than X to the half, if he restricted to Q, which had no large prime factors. So here he's uh, restricting all the prime factors of Q to be very small. But if you make this restriction, then over these special moduli, he is able to get a certain extension of the bombier vinogradov theorem. And this, again, doesn't quite take the worst residue class for every modulus Q, but at least with the refinements of the polymath project, it is quite uniform in the residue class in the sense that you can arbitrarily choose um, what in, whatever integer you like A to begin with that can be arbitrarily large compared to X. And then for that integer, you get, a, um, you get the, the vast majority of these special Qs have roughly the right number of primes, the expected number of primes in the residue class A modulo Q. And the fact that this was somewhat uniform in the residue class was very, very important for applications and in particular for Zhang's application to banner gaps between primes. So the work of Goldson, Pintz and Udirum said that if you were just able to cross this threshold of going beyond the square root of x, then you would be able to get banner gaps between primes. And Zhang showed this weak version of this where you um, don't have full uniformity in the residue class, but some uniformity on where you can take modular IQ, which are only have small prime factors. But this was a good enough unconditional substitute to combine with the earlier work of Goldson, Pintz, and Yodirum to give banner gaps between primes. So, there's been actually several different consequences of these ideas because, as I said, they're going past some critical threshold. So um, some related estimates that aren't the three theorems that I've put up here, um, but were essentially estimates fundamentally due to Fouvry, um, enabled Adelman, Fouvry, and Heath Brown to show that the first case of Fermat's last theorem is true for infinitely many prime exponents. So, of course, we now know that Fermat's last theorem is true in general, thanks to Andrew Wiles's work, but this predated Andrew Wiles's work um, by about 10 years. And so this was the first case when we knew that there were infinitely many prime exponents for which Fermat's last theorem is essentially true. And this was all based upon 
results about primes in arithmetic progressions to large moduli, in particular going beyond this square root of x. Um, secondly, uh, there's the very important work of Shang, which I've already men mentioned, that when combined with the ideas of goldson Pitts and Yodirum, Shang's uh, result about primes in arithmetic progressions to large moduli was the key input to prove that there's infinitely many banner gaps between primes. And so he showed there were, uh, banning, there were pairs of primes that differed by no more than 70 million infinitely often. Uh, and there's the results. Um, so the work of BFI with well factual weights gives, lot, gives improved bounds for all kinds of results from SIV methods. Um, Going beyond this critical x one half range gives good error terms in the Titchmarsh divisor problem, um, and then there's been rather more recent work, which, for example, allows you to get improved ranges for one-level density estimates for zeros of L functions, or good asymptotics for the number of primes which are represented as the sum of two squares plus one. Um, and these recent results are based on the same set of ideas about um, primes in arithmetic regressions to moduli bigger than square root of x. So today I'd like to talk about some new results about primes in arithmetic regressions that are of the same spirit and are given different weakened forms of the challenge conjecture, where I'm showing that you get some sort of equidistribution or expected count of primes in arithmetic progressions beyond x to the one half in various different settings. So the first theorem is like the original uh, results that I mentioned of Bombier, Friedland, and Vanyach, where we're dealing with a fixed residue class. So we're thinking of the residue class A as just being one or two, and then I have a result for moduli of size x the, a bit beyond x one half, so x the one half plus delta, you're getting the expected count for most of these moduli, provided you're looking at moduli that have a convenient size prime factor. So the theorem that I've written up here um, maybe looks a bit of a mess, um, but the key point is that I'm looking at moduli q1 times q2, which are of size about x the one half plus delta, and I'm ensuring that q1 is neither too big nor too small. And provided I'm looking at such moduli that have a convenient size prime factor, I'm getting equidistribution for this fixed residue class, um, where I'm now able to get a good error term and go concretely beyond x to one half. So maybe in slightly easier to understand language, um, I could look at moduli of size going up to x to one half plus say one over 2000, um, and at least 99% of these moduli, I can now prove have the expected count for the number of primes up to X in the residue class A modulo Q for any fixed value of A. So we're still thinking of A as being just one or two or something like that. Um, another corollary is that if I'm looking at um, moduli that factor very nicely, so I'm thinking of moduli where I have one factor of size x to the power 1 over 21 and one factor of size about x to the power 10 over 21. So the modulus itself is therefore size x to the power 11 over 21. I'm correspondingly getting a equidistribution result for such moduli. And the point here is that we can go um, a concrete reasonable distance between beyond x to the 1 half, we're getting x to the 11 over 21. And so this compares quite favorably to various previous estimates. And all of these results are measuring the error with, as, with absolute values rather than the sort of well factual weights or anything that happened before. And there's only relatively weak constraints on the moduli that I'm looking at that they need to have one factor which is in a convenient range rather than all their factors being very small. And so they can be factorized in multiple different ways. Um, or just getting weak error terms. So maybe that's the first set of results that I'd like to mention. And the key point here is that it's uh, again a good error term and applying for most moduli. The 
Second set of results that I'd like to mention are if you're working with weights. So I mentioned that for applications, one of the most important results, um, particularly from the point of view of sieve methods, is this result of Bombier, Friedland, and Vaniac, where they can go up to moduli of size four sevenths and going beyond one half to four sevenths in explicitly improves lots of uh, constants and estimates coming from sieve methods. So by refining some of the ideas going into that, um, I have a result that enables you to estimate primes in arithmetic progressions, now of size x to the three fifths rather than x to the four sevenths, provided I have some well factorable weights. Now, I don't quite have exactly the same definition of well factorable as the original BFI results, so it's something that I call triply well factorable, but I expect that this should correspond, correspondingly have various improvements to results come out from SIF methods and to give one proof of concept um, in that direction, you can think about just the linear SIF weights, which are the ones that are used in most SIF theory applications. And before you had this result of Bombier, Freeland, Evaniac, which was the state of the art, and allowed you to sieve using moduli going up to x to the power of four sevenths. Uh, now we can go up to x to the seven twelfths. Um, so if you're not an expert on the linear sieve or sieve weights or any of these things, the key point of these results is that before we had quantitative results going up to four sevenths, and this can be improved to either seven twelfths or three fifths, depending on the technical situation. And this should correspondingly improve any result on sieve methods that was previously reliant on the BFI results, of which there were several. And these are different weakened versions of the challenge problem about primes and arithmetic progressions to large moduli, where now we can go up to moduli as large as x to the three fifths, which appears to be a hard limit of any of the techniques that I know of for looking at these problems. Then the final result that I'd like to talk about is um, a set of results which are trying to emulate the amount of uniformity in the residue classes that was then the original um, bombier vinaigrado theorem. So in the original bombier vinaigrado theorem, for every modulus that appeared, you were taking genuinely the worst possible residue class. And this meant that if you look at all the collections of all possible pairs of residue class and moduli, you were looking at some absolutely huge number of um, pairs of residue class and modulus, and actually rather more pairs of residue classes and moduli than appear in any of the results that are going beyond x to one half. So these are uniform results which allow you to take the worst residue class for all the moduli that are, you're considering and allow you to go to moduli which are now bigger than x to one half. But again, I need a constraint that the moduli don't, they have some sort of convenient factorization. So I'm looking at moduli which are q1 times q2, um, where q1 and q2 are of uh, somewhat constrained sizes. So I can't quite deal with all moduli. Um, so the first result is like a uniform version of the uh, weak BFI results that a trivial bound is um, pi of x, and I'm only winning a small factor delta over the trivial bound, where delta is how far I'm going beyond x to one half. But, and I'm also restricting my moduli to look at moduli which are q1 times q2, where q1 is of size about x to one tenth. But at least in this regime, I do get a completely uniform estimate, uniform in the same way that the Bombier Vinogradov theorem was uniform, and I can get it non trivially going to moduli which are bigger than x to one half. And um, if you're allowing a slight weakening, then I can maybe a more down to earth way of saying this is that for almost all moduli of size, most x to one half plus delta, 
provided the, you're only looking at moduli that have a factor which is between about um, x to the two fifths and x to the three sevenths, then out of that collection of moduli, almost all of them have roughly the expected number of primes in every possible arithmetic regression modulo q. So the key point for these results is that it's enabling you to deal with the worst possible residue class um, for every modulus that's considered. So I think it was a problem that maybe Ben Green mentioned at Oberwolfach that uh, if, you, if for every prime of size x to the one half plus delta, you picked a residue class. Um, so for every prime q, you pick a residue class aq. Can you show there's at least one prime, which is of size at most x, in at least one of those residue classes? So I can't do that for prime moduli, but if I'm looking at, say, products of two primes, where one of the primes is of size about x to the three sevenths in the modulus, then not only do I show that you um, have at least one prime in this collection, in fact, for almost all moduli that you're looking at, uh, every residue class has roughly the expected number of primes. So some of these results are slightly technical when stated originally, but the key point is that we have various new ways of going beyond this threshold of the square root of x um, with different weakenings of the challenge problem. So I have some results where I'm requiring the residue class to be fixed, some where I'm summing with well factorable weights, and some where I'm being completely uniform. But in each of these different cases, I'm able to get non-trivial results showing some sort of weak equidistribution that the primes have roughly the expected number of uh, elements in a given residue class A modulo Q, when these Qs are larger than this square root of X threshold. Okay, so hopefully I've, you have a reasonable feeling for the results that I'd like to talk about. Um, I definitely don't want to get involved in too much of the proof. Um, in total, the three papers that I've finished a bit over 200 pages. Um, but I would like to talk about, on a slightly higher level, some of the ideas that go into this. So um, on a very high level, um, the style of the argument is very similar to lots of arguments to do with primes, and in particular, all the previous works about primes and arithmetic regressions. So, if you want to try and count the number of primes of these residue classes, typically you start off by applying some combinatorial decomposition to the counting function of the primes to express it as some count of products of two primes or products of three primes and things. So for experts here, I'm thinking about something like Vaughan's identity or the Heath-Brown identity or something coming from Harman's two. This reduces you to asking various questions about products of three primes of particular sizes in different arithmetic progressions on average. And you can use Fourier analysis to reduce this problem to estimating various different complicated looking exponential sums in lots of different ranges. Uh, so that's supposed to be Fourier analysis, not Fourier analysis. Um, and then you have these various different exponential sum estimates, um, all of which look pretty horrendous and in lots of different ranges. And depending on the precise setup, you use different techniques to bound different, ex uh, to get different exponential sum bounds. So in some ranges, you maybe use bounds that are fundamentally coming from the spectral theory of automorphic forms. And here, I'm particularly thinking of the work of Vizuri Ivanić based on uh, consequences of the Kuznetsov trace formula. Um, but we also have completely different ways of uh, understanding exponential sums based on uh, complete exponential sums and reinterpret them through the lens of algebraic geometry. And so in particular for various setups, you can coerce your messy looking exponential sums into things that can be properly 
estimated using techniques from algebraic geometry. So in particular here, I'm thinking about the Bay bounds or bounds coming from the Lean spoof of the Riemann hypothesis for varieties over finite fields. So there are two fundamental ways of uh, bounding these exponential sums. And fortunately, they combine quite nicely, but in some ranges when you can't use this sort of spectral automorphic forms techniques, you can use bounds coming from algebraic geometry and vice versa. Um, so then there's a very messy optimization that you can bound some of these, but you have to hope that your bounds are good enough that you can cover all the possible different ranges that are spat out from you, spat out at you from this combinatorial decomposition and the uh, Fourier analysis turning the problem into exponential sums. But there may be, maybe the tagline is that you're following this sand overview to reduce things to exponential sums and we're then trying to combine different ways of bounding exponential sums, some from algebraic geometry and some coming from uh, automorphic forms, which often has the uh, tagline clustermania because it's to do with sums of clusters and stuff. So I'd like to just very briefly mention how these different things arise. So the use of the spectral theory and the bounds coming from automorphic forms uh, was a absolutely key feature in the original work of Bombieri, Fruvri, Friedlander and Ivanovic. And in particular, uh, the Kuznets of trace formula allows you to take um, certain nice looking sums of Klusterman sums, which are a very special type of exponential sum that fortunately and somewhat miraculously is very common in analytic number theory, in particular these problems about primes and arithmetic progressions, and to reinterpret these sums of Klusterman sums as averages or Fourier coefficients of automorphic forms. And so if you can understand reasonably well averages of Fourier coefficients of automorphic forms, this allows you to get very good bounds on uh, sums of Klusterman sums, and there's a whole variety of techniques for trying to uh, twist and manipulate the sums that you have that come out from these problems about primes and arithmetic progressions into things that are very amenable to be reinterpreted as sums of Klusterman sums. And typically, these can give um exceptionally strong bounds whenever you have the your exponential sums of the right form and another very nice feature is that these methods often work very well um they don't have any particular constraints on the sorts of moduli that you're looking at but one big downside of any of the spectral theory techniques is that when you're looking at questions about say primes and arithmetic progressions they typically don't give any uniformity or very poor uniformity with respect to the residue class. And so if you're allowing yourself to use the spectral type techniques, you typically can't get very uniform results coming out as the final answers. So the other way of bounding exponential sums that I mentioned was using techniques that were rooted in algebraic geometry. And in particular, this was a very, very important feature of Zhang's work on Primes and arithmetic progressions. So here there's a maybe wider variety of exponential sums that are amenable to this method, provided the exponential sums look like um, algebraic exponential sums, then you can reinterpret these exponential sums um, in a very algebraic manner, and in particular as the size of various cohomology groups associated to some curves or varieties. And then you can use the uh, deep work of Fay and Deline to get very good understanding of these cohomology groups and correspondingly get very good understanding and good bounds to these algebraic exponential sums. And there's a whole set of techniques for trying to turn the sorts of exponential sums that are spat out by the Fourier analysis methods into the right kind of exponential sums that are amenable to these estimates coming from algebraic geometry. And one big benefit of these algebraic geometry estimates is that they 
typically are very, very uniform with respect to lots of the parameters involved. And so in particular, they tend not to worry too much about precisely what residue classes you're looking at. Um, but one downside is that it's very hard to um, the standard exponential sums that come out if you're trying to look at these one behavior for the guard of variance. And typically, they only work provided the moduli factor conveniently. So in Zhang's work, he assumed that the moduli could factor as well as he would possibly like because they only had uh, small prime factors. You could always split module up many times into factors of whatever size you wanted. And so this is why his work was exceptionally, exceptionally amenable to the algebraic geometry exponential sum estimates. And the uniformity of the algebraic geometry estimates was why he was able to get a moderately uniform result, which was very important for proving Banner cap screen primes. So on a very basic level, um, my work is maybe trying to come up with different ways of combining these two different approaches based on the spectral theory of automorphic forms and uh, different estimates coming from algebraic geometry. But unfortunately, if you try and do this naively, uh, the two techniques really don't combine well at all. That it turns out that there's a single worst case scenario, essentially for both techniques, which is when you're looking at products of five prime factors, all of size x to one fifth in this decomposition that comes out. And in order to try and handle these, uh, your whole, my whole method would uh, almost degenerate entirely down to Zhang's argument uh, to handle this one special case. Um, and so you're almost winning nothing if you just try and now you can combine two arguments. However, to make progress, the key idea of what I did was to introduce refinements to both methods based on the spectral theory of automorphic forms and uh, refinements to the algebraic geometry style estimates to uh, handle what was previously the worst case scenarios. And so there would then be new worst case scenarios. But fortunately, after handling these worst case scenarios, um, what's the worst case scenario for, say, the spectral estimates is actually one of the best case scenarios for the algebraic geometry estimates. And so the methods then combine very nicely since I have to use some of the spectral methods, that's why the first few theorems I had still required the residue class to be fixed. Since I still need to use some of the algebraic geometry estimates, that's why there's still some requirements, at least in the first few um, results on the moduli having a convenient size prime factor, but these are both fairly weak requirements um, because I'm using them in their, I'm only using the techniques in the regions when they're most effective and they're very complementary to one to one another once I've handled the worst case scenarios. So again, I really don't want to go and dive too much into technicalities of what I'm modifying on either the spectral theory approach or the algebraic geometry approach, but I'd like to give at least a few hints of some of the flavor of the things that I'm doing. So uh, for the new ideas, uh, modifying the spectral theory approach to these different estimates that come out from looking at primes and arithmetic progressions, um, my modification is inspired by a technique known as the amplification method by uh, Friedlander and Avaniage. Um, and in fact, in some ways, it's the sort of opposite of the amplification method that the amplification method uh, tends to uh, involve some trivial step and uh, at the beginning that looks like you're losing an awful lot um, and encountering a different but rather more complicated sum, but then you can use um, greater knowledge about estimates in families to nonetheless uh, win a little bit, so you're doing a huge gambit. Um, and typically, in the amplification method, you want to 
increase the contributions from certain diagonal terms, whereas in my case, you want to do almost the opposite and decrease the contribution from various diagonal terms. But the approach is still similar. I'm going to take a gambit where I'm doing something that looks exceptionally artificial at the beginning and looks like it can only possibly hurt me. But it turns out that once you filter through the argument, this technical modification at a critical stage of the argument allows you to win a very small amount, even if it makes everything else much more complicated. But if that critical stage is the one bottleneck in your argument and you can adequately handle all the other more complicated estimates, then you can nonetheless balance these things to enable you to win. And so what I do here is I introduce a completely artificial congruence constraint at a very early stage of the argument. Once you go through some of these technical manipulations, this congruence constraint um, after uh, flipping divisors uh, translates into, into forcing a factorization of one variable. And factorizations are very convenient uh, for the point of view of lots of analytic techniques. And this factorization allows you to win a tiny bit in the most important part of the argument, even if you're losing quite a lot in lots of the other parts of the argument. But fortunately, you can balance things so that you win a bit in the important case and you don't lose too much in any of the unimportant cases. And this allows you to just win overall. And this handles the uh, completely critical worst case scenario of the original Bulgarian Friedlander event arguments. Um, on the algebraic geometry side, I introduced some uh, rather different new ideas, which are instead inspired by uh, transference ideas coming from additive combinatorics. So transference principles um, in additive combinatorics say that um, if you're looking for certain estimates in a dense set, you often don't need to know anything much about the dense set, uh, provided you can uh, understand certain more technical estimates to do with the set which they lie in, which is dense. And the sort of philosophy for how you do this is you repeatedly apply cauchy schwartz to replace certain um, unknown coefficients by smooth ones. And you accept that you're just building up lots and lots and lots of technical conditions. Every time you're applying cauchy schwartz you're maybe doubling the number of technical conditions that apply. But you're winning something because you're smoothing some of these complicated coefficients. And you hope that you can arrange this, that you can eventually come up with some sum which maybe involves lots and lots of coefficients and a huge number of technical conditions, but all the coefficients are completely smooth. And you can estimate these even though there's lots of these different technical conditions. So my setup's a little bit different because I might have sparse variables rather than dense variables that uh, restricts what you're able to do. But following this sort of philosophy of just accepting that you're piling up lots of technical conditions, which you're only going to deal with right at the end, um, I am able to uh, come up with arguments uh, that enable you to get uh, <coughs> non-trivial estimates in at least some very particular ranges. And I guess one of the key features of this algebraic geometry approach inspired by the transference ideas is that these are now completely uniform with respect to the rest of your classes. So this is totally vital for the final results I was talking about, which are uniform in the same way that Bombier and the graph theorem is uniform. Um, OK. So, <laughs> um, I'm almost out of time. But just to summarize what I said, there's then this very technical game of trying to hope that all your refinements are quantity, quantitatively good enough that you can just about cover all these different ranges. And so you have lots of different estimates that work well in different ranges. And you hope that combined, these estimates can cover all possible ranges. And because we could deal with the previous worst case scenarios, um, we can now change the worst case scenarios, which is when the um, Spectral estimates combine very well with the algebraic geometry estimates, and that allows you to fundamentally 
cover all different ranges, um, although lots of additional technical work is needed to get good quantitative bounds. So here's a very brief style of the different kinds of techniques where we use in either algebraic geometry or spectral theory to follow various different styles of estimation exponential sums based on various different previous works. And with different refinements, each of these can handle some important range. And this is just enough to cover all different ranges that come in a combinatorial decomposition for the primes. And putting everything together, uh, this gives the results that I mentioned about primes and arithmetic progressions. OK, so thanks a lot for listening. Um, I hope you enjoyed the talk. And I'll pass over to questions now. Thank you, James, for your uh, for beautiful talk. So I'd like everyone to unmute their microphone and, and clap for our speaker today. <laughs>